Okay, it's two minutes past two, so I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you everyone for coming along today. I'd like you to uh, like to welcome you. Um, oh, sorry, I'm going to have to multitask because people are arriving, so I'm going to click admit as I'm talking. Um, welcome you to our Shame in Medical History seminar series. Um, and we have Michael Brown um, speaking today. So this is a seminar series that's organized by the Shame and Medicine Project at the University of Exeter, which is a welcome funded research project that looks at the role of shame in um, healthcare and in health and in medicine. And we're collaborating with our Center for Medical History here at the University of Exeter um, to put this seminar series together. So we're having a two to three events a year, um, inviting historians to reflect on the shame in various aspects or facets um, in medical history. So our last talk was Fred Cooper, who spoke about loneliness and shame, and I'm really thrilled today to welcome Michael Brown um, from Lancaster today to speak. Um, he previously spoke at a Shame in Medicine event in 2017. I was just looking up when it was, actually, because it's quite a few years ago, uh, when the project was based at Trinity College Dublin in a sort of slightly different form. And so I'm really thrilled to welcome him back. Um, just to give a bio, um, Michael is a cultural historian of medicine, surgery, gender, and war with a special interest in politics, identities, and emotions. Um, between 2016 and 2021, he was PI on the Wellcome Trust funded project, Surgery and Emotion, which some of you might know. And his most recent monograph, Emotions, and Surgery in Britain, 1793 to 1912, um, was published by Cambridge University Press um, in 2022, comes from the work from that project. Um, he's currently developing a new research project with Joanne Begato, I hope I've said that right, of Oxford Brookes University on an emotional embodied history of the hand in Victorian Britain. Um, he's joined University of Lancaster in 2022. And I'm going to hand it over to Michael now. His talk um, is entitled Bodily Shame in Romantic Surgery. And I believe he's going to share his screen so we can see his slides. Yep. And just to let everyone know, this is being recorded. So if you don't want to um, appear on the recording, just keep your camera off. Um, and afterwards, this talk will be the recording of this talk will be sent to everyone who signed up um, for the seminar and also be available on our website. And I'll take it away, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, uh, Luna. Yeah, I mean, um, so I'd like to uh, begin by welcoming you all uh, to my talk this afternoon um, to thank and thank you all for your interest in my research. I would also like to extend my thanks to the Shame and Medicine Project team, uh, and particularly uh, Luna, for the invitation to give this talk. And as Luna mentioned, this is the second time I've had the um, privilege of speaking at a Shame and Medicine event. And Back in what now is the dim and distant days of 2017, I spoke, uh, I gave a paper on, on living with regret in 19th century surgery uh, to the workshop at, held at Trinity College Dublin uh, that Luna mentioned. And at that time, of course, uh, Shoma Medicine was, I guess, still in its infancy and, and, and something of a pilot project. And much has clearly changed since then and now a flourishing Wellcome Trust Collaborative Award project. Um, now, as Luna mentioned, at the time of that initial paper, now, if I can move my slides on. There we go. At the time of that initial paper, my own research project, uh, Surgery in Emotion, was also in its relative infancy, uh, having been underway for just over a year. But for the sake of context and for the benefit of those of you who are unfamiliar with the project, as Luna mentions, this was a Wellcome Trust funded investigator award that uh, ran between 2016 uh, and 2021, 20, uh, and which was based at the University of Roehampton in London. Um, uh, and the project explored the emotional landscape of British surgery from the late 18th century uh, to the present day. And in addition to me, included two postdoctoral research fellows, an engagement fellow and a PhD student. And if you'd like to know uh, more information about the project, uh, please do visit our website at www.surgeryandemotion.com. Now, since giving that paper back in 2017, much has changed for me too, not least a switch of institution affiliation. Uh, the instability of the UK higher education sector, uh, particularly in the humanities and especially among modern universities, meant that I was forced to take voluntary redundancy from uh, the University of Roehampton last year and took up a new post, uh, as Luna mentioned, um, in the history department at Lancaster University. 
Uh, more importantly, and certainly more gratifyingly, at around the same time, uh, my book, Emotions and Surgery in Britain, 1793 uh, to 1912, um, was published by uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, and thanks to uh, funding from the Wellcome Trust, uh, this book and all the other publications of published outputs on the project, um, are, which are listed on our website, are available uh, fully open access. So if you haven't uh, seen my book uh, and you'd like to know more after this talk, please do um, check that out. Um, now, I hope you'll excuse this brief biographical opening, if only because it provides some context for my paper. When Luna first invited me to give a talk as part of the Shame and Medical History Seminar series back in December 2021, the manuscript of my book had just gone off to the publishers. Hence, while some seminar talks adopt a work in progress approach, this paper has given me a chance to look back over my research. It has also allowed me to approach that research from a slightly different angle. This is because even though my book is concerned with the emotions of surgery in the long 19th century, and contains references to a wide range of emotional concepts and clusters, from uh, anger and anxiety to pity and sympathy, there is no index entry for shame, and the term appears only four times in some 140,000 words of text. When reflecting on this during the preparation for my paper, I wondered what this might signify. Had shame somehow managed to evade my analytical eye? Had I missed something intellectually and culturally substantive by seemingly, neglect, seemingly neglecting the role of shame in 19th century operative surgery? As I hope to show in my paper today, I don't believe that I have. And I say this not by way of special pleading, but because the relative absence of shame from my book is the product neither of accidental omission nor of conscious exclusion. Rather, it is a product of the archive itself, or at least the archives that I used in my research. Now, during the course of my research, I spent many months in the uh, library of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, photographing thousands of pages of manuscript documents. Chief among these, as we shall see, were the personal papers of the leading early 19th century surgeon, um, uh, Astley Cooper, including numerous case books from his near 50 years of hospital practice, as well as hundreds of letters that he received from his patients and their medical attendants. This collection alone yielded three and a half thousand digital images that were subsequently transcribed and coded into an in vivo database. Intriguingly, the word shame and its cognates, such as ashamed, do not appear once in this collection. And this is in marked contrast, as we'll see, to the word anxiety, which appears over 40 times in the same data set. This paper is, in some senses, then, about the absence of shame in early 19th century surgical culture. But it is not solely about absence, at least I hope not. Rather, it is about the relative utility of shame as a concept for shaping our understandings of clinical interaction and patient experience in 19th century surgery. The key purpose of my book has been to elucidate the emotional cultures of surgery across the long 19th century, a period of immense change. At the beginning of the century, British surgeons were seeking to divest themselves of the historic associations with manual trade, fashioning identities as learned scientific gentlemen, a status confirmed, at least in part, by the establishment of the Royal College of, Physi of Surgeons in 1800. By the end of the century, meanwhile, they had ascended to the pinnacle of the medical hierarchy and were fated by many as heroic medical miracle workers of the modern age. This change in status was partly the product of astute social self-fashioning, but it also owed much to the fact that operative surgery had undergone a revolutionary transformation across the century. In 1800, operations were generally conducted as a last resort and with scant hope of ultimate cure. Moreover, they were performed with little or no pain relief and with the distinct likelihood of complications that could lead to death. In 1900, by contrast, they were generally conducted under anaesthesia in aseptic conditions that significantly reduced the likelihood of post-operative infection and with increased expectation of a successful outcome. While surgeons of the early 19th century rarely intruded too deeply into the body's main cavities of head, thorax, stomach and abdomen, those of the early 20th century were removing brain tumours and would soon be operating on the valves of the heart. Surgery was close to becoming what Thomas Schlich has characterised as the technological fix for the bodily ills of the modern age. Now, such histories lend themselves very easily to triumphalist narratives, and it is therefore a commonplace of popular accounts and professional lore 
that the 19th century witnessed the redemption of surgery from a dark age of bloody brutality and casual cruelty to a shining modernity of compassionate cleanliness and scientific sophistication. Without wanting to contest the fact that the later 19th, that later 19th century surgery was indeed more ambitious, less fraught with danger, and infinitely less painful than that of the early 1800s, one of the things my book has sought to do is to challenge the stereotype of the pre-anesthetic surgeon as a callous butcher, one who cared nothing for the feelings of his patient or at best exercised what William Hunter has called a kind of, so William Hunter famously called a kind of necessary inhumanity in operating on the conscious, writhing, screaming patient. What I argue is that it was precisely the emotionally and constitutionally grueling nature of pre-anesthetic surgery that made emotion so important to contemporary surgical practice. In an age when there was an intimate con uh, connection between body and mind, and when feelings could quite literally kill, it was imperative for the surgeon not only be aware of his patient's mood, but also to manage their emotions in order to promote a positive outcome. It is for this reason I would contend that the word anxiety appears so frequently in the historical record, not simply because anxiety was the natural corollary of contemplating an agonizing and potentially fatal procedure, but because the presence of anxiety was something that had to be acknowledged, recorded, and taken into consideration by the surgical operator. Now, this relative emotional sensitivity was further sustained by broader cultural currents. As I argue in the book, the influence of romanticism on pre-anesthetic surgery was profound, so much so, in fact, that I've chosen to call the period from the 1790s to the 1840s an era of romantic surgery, one in which the values of surgery were shaped by an emotional regime of romantic sensibility that valorized emotional experience, encouraged emotional reflection, and lauded the qualities of sympathy and compassion especially when directed towards those thought to be both dependent and vulnerable, such as women and children. What I want to argue in this paper is that this surgical culture allowed relative, relatively little space for shame, either as an intersubjective emotion or as a clinical observation, except in certain circumstances. At a time when effective diagnosis, prognosis and treatment were thought to depend so heavily on emotional honesty and indeed emotional authenticity, Shame, a feeling that tends to encourage concealment, could have potentially fatal results. This is not to say that patients did not conceal their condition, for many did. But as I will argue, those acts of concealment tended to have other emotional origins. Likewise, while modern conceptions of bodily perfection, shaped as they are by advances in medicine and surgery, have tended to stigmatize illness, especially disfiguring illness, encouraging feelings of shame, I would suggest that such stigma was less prevalent in an age when bodily disfigurement was far more common and when many people were forced to endure conditions, the extreme physical manifestations of which are now almost um, inconceivable. And I should man I, I remember now that I've forgotten to say something at the beginning of this paper uh, as just a kind of a warning to everyone that this paper does contain, as you'll already have seen, some graphic images of, of disease and of operative surgery, and also some uh, graphic descriptions of, of um, disease and surgery. So, so please be aware of that. Now, this is uh, not to say that shame was entirely absent from early 19th century surgery, of course. As we shall see, there are certain conditions that appear in the archive, notably those relating to sexual morality, where feelings of embarrassment are more likely to be expressed or inferred. Even here, however, other emotions, notably anxiety, tend more to define the experience and representation of these afflictions than shame. Indeed, what we shall find is that early 19th century surgical patients were often remarkably candid about their bodily health, even when it related to quite intimate and potentially embarrassing matters. And they were likewise candid about the extreme emotional distress that these afflictions caused them, as well as the ways in which their state of mind shaped their physical well-being. Now, in order to explore the place of shame in romantic surgical culture, especially as it relates to patient experience, I want to draw primarily on the invaluable archive of letters that I already mentioned, held as part of Astley Cooper's papers at the Royal College of Surgeons, 
Now, the patient's voice is often faint and elusive in the historical record, especially so in the pre-modern period. But within these hundreds of letters, we can hear that voice with occasionally remarkable clarity and get a sense of the agency, including emotional agency, that patients exercise in their relations with surgeons. Having said this, some caveats are necessary. Firstly, Astley Cooper was perhaps the leading English surgical operator of the early 19th century, consulting surgeon to Guy's Hospital in London and possessed of an extensive practice among the city's wealthiest citizens. Indeed, in 1813, one of his patients, a West Indian merchant by the name of Mr Hyatt, gave him a fee of a thousand guineas for the removal of a stone, a sum equivalent roughly uh, to £56,000 today. Now, in other words, Cooper's patients were clearly not representative of the population as a whole. But this is not to say that they were all rich or even essentially uh, or even necessarily from the higher social classes. In addition to his hospital practice among the poorer sort, there are numerous instances recorded in his archive in which he was approached by practitioners, some of them his former students, seeking his assistance with a patient whose condition had confounded them and who could ill afford the services of London's leading surgeon. Now, these practitioners often appealed to the ideals of romantic sensibility in requesting Cooper's gratuitous advice. For example, in October 1832, Cooper was visited by a woman bearing a note from Roger Nunn of Colchester, which read as follows, and this is the quote on the slide. Mrs Eakins, the bearer of this, is a widow lady with a large family and very, very small means. This, I know, will be a sufficient passport to your heart and lay claim to your judgment without a fee. Do her and me the favour to look at her breast and say whether you think it malignant or otherwise. For myself, I hope and believe that it is not. Any plan you may suggest for her benefit, I shall have the pleasure in following up upon the same principle with which I have taken the liberty of sending her to you. So basically he's saying, please treat her for free and I will in turn treat her for free. Now clearly, not all the letters in Cooper's archive were written by the patients themselves. Many were penned by family members or by their medical attendants, as was the case here. And yet, given the importance ascribed to emotions in the generation, management and treatment of disease, it seems likely that medical attendants and other interested parties will be concerned to communicate an ac as accurate an account of the patient's state of mind as possible. Thus, while we must be conscious of the presence of mediation within these texts, they can still provide an invaluable insight, if not always into the subjective experience of disease, then certainly into the representation and communication of suffering. Now, as this letter suggests, one of the most common conditions that appears in Cooper's archive is cancer of the breast. Cooper was one of the leading authorities on breast cancer in this period and the author of the 1829 text, Illustration of the Diseases of the Breast. As such, he was regularly approached by women and their medical attendants for advice on this matter. In the early 19th century, and indeed for the entirety of human history up until the latter decades of the 20th century, breast cancer was a virulent, disfiguring and invariably fatal condition. The few treatments available, such as the application of caustics to disperse the tumour or an operation to excise it, were drastic, painful and generally unsuccessful. As such, women understandably dreaded the appearance of symptoms, but in this they were not alone. So grim was surgeons, most surgeons' experience of treating breast cancer that, as John Abernethy, another leading surgeon of the period, claimed, quote, Having seen these cases turn out so unfortunately, I began to be very much afraid of them, end quote. Likewise, writing to Cooper uh, in 1833, this Nottingham surgeon Henry Oldno wrote that, quote, the results of my operation for cancerous mammae are so unfavourable that I now never undertake them with any certainty Sorry. of success. I leave it to my pa patients to say whether they will submit to the operation with a view of obtaining an indefinite respite to their present sufferings, rather than to expect from it a permanent cure. Now, in many ways, breast cancer might seem to be a disease potentially productive of feelings of shame in its sufferers. After all, the breast is a deeply intimate body part, closely connected with ideas and ideals of femininity and maternity. As numerous scholars have argued, 
Diseases of the breast could therefore have a particularly profound impact on women's sense of self. Moreover, the emphasis placed on the breast as a signifier of both maternal and sexual identity tended to make it at once highly visible in an era that valorized ideals of natural motherhood, but also veiled as an illicit object of erotic desire. And indeed, despite the changing nature of women's fashion across this period, from the bust emphasizing lines and sheer fabrics of Regency neoclassicism to the material exuberance of the 1830s, the fact remains that the bearing of a body part as intimate as the breast to an adult male stranger remained a potentially deeply embarrassing and evil sh even shameful act, especially if that breast, that great signifier of an essentialized femininity, was disfigured by disease. Now, we can perhaps detect something of these dynamics in Cooper's own work. For example, in a remarkable passage from the introduction to his illustrations of the diseases of the breast, Cooper imagines the scene presented by a woman coming to consult him about a lump in her bosom. This woman, whom he casts as the mother of a large family, dependent upon her for protection, education and support, is evidently deeply troubled, troubled by the experience. As he writes, quote, pale and trembling, she enters the surgeon's apartment and, bearing her bosom, faintly articulates, Sir, I am come to consult you for a cancer in my breast. Now, ultimately, Cooper's physical examination of her breast reveals that the tumour is not cancerous. Her spirits are thereby lifted, and as Cooper puts it, quote, the sudden transformation from apprehension to joy brightens her countenance with the smile of gratitude. Even so, the description of this woman as pale and trembling and as faintly articulating her self-diagnosis might suggest a certain embarrassment, even shame, at her condition and at the prospect of having to reveal her breast to the celebrated metropolitan practitioner. Now, elsewhere in Cooper's archive, there are documents that might encourage similar readings. This image, for example, is a watercolour portrait of Elizabeth Lowe, a 29-year-old woman admitted to the casualty hospital in Cheltenham on the 26th of August, 1828. It was communicated to Cooper by Charles W. Turner, a pupil at Guy's Hospital, on behalf of the Cheltenham surgeon, Charles Averill. Most immediately, of course, what this image vividly communicates is the potentially extreme clinical presentation of breast cancer at a time when detection was difficult and treatments almost entirely inefficacious. In his letter, Averill told Cooper that, quote, the accompanying drawing gives a very accurate representation of the disease at the present time. The edges of the sore being very irregularly thickened, the middle deeply excavated and partly covered with small yellow sloughs and discharging a bloody sunniest fluid. But beyond this, it might also suggest something about the emotional dynamics at work here. Elizabeth Lowe was already suffering from a horrific illness when she was asked to bear her disfigured breast to a strange man, perhaps even several strange men, not only for the purpose of clinical investigation, but also in order to record her experience, her, so her appearance for posterity. In this context, it is notable to find that her guard, so it is notable um, that her gaze is directed away from the viewer, her eyes cast resolutely downward. Now, this is not simply an artistic convention. After all, several other pathological portraits in Cooper's collection have the sitter directly meeting the gaze of the viewer. Could this therefore be suggestive of shame or at the very least embarrassment? Perhaps, but I would like to suggest a somewhat different reading of this image, as well as of the excerpt from Cooper's book. In both of these instances, I would argue, the apparent reticence and discomfort on the part of the female patient serves less to communicate shame than to enhance the inherent pathos of their plight. As I have suggested, the cultures of early 19th century surgery were profoundly shaped by the values of romantic sensibility, including its sentimentalized configurations of femininity, especially motherhood. Breast cancer, with its virulent presentation and high mortality, was thus deeply troubling, troubling to established gender ideologies. It is no coincidence, I think, that in both Roger Nunn's letter about Mrs. Eakins and in Cooper's own imagined vignette, the woman concerned is represented as the mother of a large dependent family. Motherhood was similarly key to Elizabeth Lowe's identity, albeit in an even more tragic way. According to Avril, she had borne six children, quote, of whom only one is living, end quote. 
and was pregnant again when she developed cancer. Some three and a half weeks before her death, she was delivered of a boy, quote, who was not permitted to take the breast. And after that point, she sunk faster and the ulceration extended more rapidly. Motherhood was by no means incidental to the experience of breast cancer in this period. The association was not merely imaginative or allegorical. Rather, motherhood was central to contemporary understandings of breast cancer in the most profound way imaginable. Early 19th century surgical orthodoxy had it that one of the most common causes of breast cancer was physical trauma, such as a blow to the breast. But another important cause, and one that is perhaps most prevalent in Cooper's archive, is anxiety of mind. Indeed, in almost every single instance of breast cancer that appears in Cooper's letters, case books, and other materials, anxiety of mind is either recorded as a cause or its relative absence is noted. And in every single case, that anxiety can be linked to what we might call the emotion work of real and idealized femininities, especially motherhood. As Joanne Bajato has suggested, anxiety was an essential state of parenting in this period, and some even saw it as the natural state of mothers. It was not a shameful emotion, but rather a badge of sensitivity and refinement, and thus a trait of good parenting. However, due to the intimate relationship that subsisted between mental and bodily states within the romantic medical cosmology, anxiety could take a profound toll on women's health. Childbirth itself could either bring about cancer or exacerbate it, as had been the case with Elizabeth Lowe. Likewise, the ill health of a child could induce disease, such as with Mrs. Palmer of Wellingborough, who came to see Astley Cooper in 1836, bearing a note from her surgeon, recording that she had received a blow on the breast, quote, from an intoxicated man, but that about the time of receiving the blow, she was in painful anxiety of mind from the continued illness of her son, which I should suppose so operated upon the constitution as to depose it to scirrus inflammation, end quote. Now, if childhood disease could cause deep anxiety, then the death of a child could be emotionally and physically devastating. This had clearly been true for Elizabeth Lowe and was also the case for a 53 year old woman named Mrs. Bull, about whom Cooper noted that, quote, she has been very anxious in mind from the loss of a child. And also in the instance of another woman of whom he observed that she had, quote, anxiety of mind from the loss of a daughter two years ago, end quote. Now, what is notable about these circumstances is that they were a commonplace experience of motherhood in this period. In this sense, then, breast cancer can be said to have constituted the essential disease of motherhood in the Romantic era, the dark inverse of the kinds of sentimentalized depictions favored by contemporary artists. And yet it, too, was sentimentalized in its own way, drenched, as I have suggested, in a visual and literary language of pathos. We may never know what exactly Elizabeth Lowe was feeling when her portrait was being painted, or what emotions ran through the minds of the women entering Cooper's consulting rooms. Nevertheless, I think we can argue with some confidence that their representation was couched not in terms of shame, but rather in terms of pity. Thus, in Elizabeth Lowe's portrait, we might perceive a cognate form of that sublime suffering so powerfully represented by Charles Bell's paintings of the war wounded from Waterloo one of which, seen here, depicts a similarly downcast gaze, and which thereby does similar intersubjective emotional work, communicating the essential humanity of the sufferer and evoking the pity and sympathy of the viewer. Now, if the prevailing emotional register of breast cancer's cultural representation was pity, then the defining emotion of its personal experience was not shame, but rather anxiety. As I've suggested, the word anxiety is threaded through the documents in Cooper's archive, not only as a cause of disease, but also, unsurprisingly, as a consequence, and indeed, as a complicating factor in determining diagnosis and treatment. It was a commonplace of contemporary surgical discourse that patients, particularly those who thought themselves to be suffering from breast cancer, often concealed their conditions from medical practitioners, avoiding treatment often until it was too late. Not, of course, that early treatment carried any guarantee of success in this period. As the Blackburn surgeon James Barlow told Astley Cooper, quote, it is lamentable to recount 
that numerous cases of tumours which I have witnessed and which have either been neglected on the one hand by the supinity of the patient or from ignorance and timidity of the surgeon on the other, insomuch that the disease has ultimately become exacerbated beyond the aid of the scientific surgeon. Now, I was once asked by a colleague when giving a talk about Cooper's work on breast cancer, whether shame played a role in this apparent propensity for patients to conceal their condition. My feeling is that this is entirely possible, but that I see little direct evidence for it in the archive. Barlow may have used the morally loaded term supine to describe those women who did not seek medical aid at the first presentation of symptoms. But the numerous letters that Cooper received from women, their family members and medical attendants suggest that the primary motivation for concealment was fear. Fear of the disease, fear of its treatment and ultimately, of course, fear of death, something which continues to haunt the diagnosis of cancer today, let alone at this point in history. For example, in February 1832, Cooper received a letter from the husband of Mrs. Sheath of Wyberton in Lincolnshire, who had previously had a lump in her right breast extracted by Cooper at his Regent Street home. In the interim, however, as he explained, quote, and this is the quote on the slide, Mrs. S has had the misfortune to lose an affectionate brother, and not many months have elapsed since her only sister, who was her nurse and companion, departed this life after a very short illness which circumstances have left her in great grief and affliction, and I fear have contributed a great deal to the return of the complaint. There is a small lump by the side of the same breast which now and then gives her pain, but she dislikes to mention it to Mr. Snaith, her apothecary. I therefore cannot allow her to proceed any further without acquainting you of the circumstance and requesting you to give me your excellent advice in what, all manner, in what manner we ought to pursue. It has not been of so long standing as the former, no, nor near so large, and it would be a great comfort to us both if it could possibly be dispersed in preference to another operation, the thoughts of which make her, as you may suppose, very uneasy and dejected. Now here, Mrs. Sheath's reticence to mention the return of her symptoms to her medical attendant appear to have stemmed, at least in part, from her fear at the prospect of undergoing another agonizingly painful operation. The same fear also induced another woman, Mrs. Macareth of Lancaster, to conceal the return of her symptoms, even from those closest to her. Her physician, Edward Dennis de Vitre, wrote to Cooper in December 1833, stating that Macareth, who, like Sheath, had already undergone a surgical excision, was, quote, naturally of a cheerful disposition, but that she dreads the idea of another operation. Unfortunately, de Vitre continued, Quote, she has all along observed the strictest secrecy regarding her complaint and only informed her husband of it a week ago. As such, her condition was quite advanced, and de Vitre told Cooper that I have not flattered Mr. Macrath's expectations. Now, in other instances, women were gripped by a sense of hopelessness at the possibility of cure, even before they had sought medical advice. In 1836, for instance, Frances White of Thatcham in Berkshire wrote to Cooper with a history of her case, which began aged 28, when she, quote, discovered a small lump about forming about the size of a nutmeg on the top of my left breast near my duct. White, quote, took little notice of it for a year or more as it gave her little pain. However, she later, quote, began to have shooting pains in my breast and the lump gradually increased. It was only age 36 when the tumour started to discharge what she called something like clear water that she went to see Cooper, quote, something I very much regret not having done in the first beginning of the disease. As she explained, I never let any medical gentleman see it before Sir Astley, for as I resided in the country, I had not sufficient confidence to think that they could do me any good, the doctors in Berkshire having but little experience in such cases. Now, such fatalism can easily be understood because surgeons were rarely the bearers of good news. Indeed, one of Cooper's patients, a woman from West Burton in the Yorkshire Dales, wrote to express her profound gratitude to him because he had been her salvation when, quote, Mr. Hay of Leeds told my son that I could not survive six weeks and that all the surgeons in England could not save my life. Now, as I've suggested, one of the reasons why there seems to have been relatively little room for shame in the clinical encounter is because at a time when the patient's narrative continued to play an important role in the diagnosis of disease, 
And when the treatment of disease also involved the management of the patient's state of mind, a degree of openness and honesty was essential. This could extend to even the most intimate of conditions. In 1835, for instance, the surgeon John Dalton of Bury St Edmunds sent his daughter Hannah to see Cooper in the company of his son and fellow surgeon John Dalton Jr. The accompanying letter began by stating that she had suffered from a stricture in her rectum. This was not all, he continued, though bad enough. For she has been married, I think, four years and has an excellent kind husband, but the coitus has never been consummated, I fear, from malformation of the parts. Dalton explained that the projection of the urinary metus and perineum nearly covered the vagina and left only, quote, a very small entrance into which the penis has never yet entered. Whether this derived from a, quote, original malformation or had been uh, compounded by what he euphemistically called the many anxious and ardent attempts to acquire possession of the matrimonial domicile, I leave, he claimed, to your better judgment. Now, relative openness when it came to quite intimate complaints was also a feature of Cooper's dealings with his male patients. While they are far less common in his archive than breast cancer sufferers, Cooper had an interest in testicular cancer and treated a number of men for this condition, as well as for more general genitourinary complaints. In her forthcoming book on men's sexual health in early modern England, which I have the pleasure of reading ahead of publication, Jennifer Evans dedicates an entire chapter to the concepts of embarrassment and shame in relation to men's intimate health. As she argues, quote, despite the potential for these conditions to undermine men's physical um, manliness, embarrassment and shame were not automatic responses to having a genitourinary complaint, end quote. Now, I think similar observations can also be made of the early 19th century. This is not to say that men were entirely without feelings of embarrassment but rather, as Evans has found, that they were aware of the need to be open and honest in order to receive the most accurate diagnosis and most effective treatment. For example, in May 1840, Cooper received a letter from the antiquarian Norris Scatchard of Morley near Leeds, who, following treatment for a hydrocele, had developed a testicular tumour whose size and weight caused him great discomfort. He wrote to Cooper in advance of a potential in-person consultation, stating that, quote, as I am a country gentleman, wholly ignorant of your profession, and might be abashed, timid, and forgetful in your presence, it seems most prudent to write to you by my fireside as accurate an account of my case as can be expected from such a person as myself. Now, Scatcher's letter suggests a certain apprehension but this seems to have stemmed more from his self-conscious lack of metropolitan sophistication than from an embarrassment about his condition. Having said this, it is notable that he sought to make it very clear that he had, quote, never in my life um, have had, sorry, that he had never in my life have, have had any of those complaints which are occasioned by imprudence. And you can see here on the slide uh, the words any and imprudence both being double underlined for emphasis. Now, if breast cancer in this period was closely associated with the essential qualities of femininity, then testicular cancer was similarly rooted in normatively masculine activities and conventional, albeit occasionally excessive, male appetites. Like breast cancer, testicular cancer was also closely associated with anxiety of mind. For instance, Cooper described one of his male hospital patients as having, quote, drank hard and been of late anxious in mind on account of his business going wrong. While at the opposite end of the social spectrum, one of Cooper's surgical correspondents wrote to him concerning one Mr. H, a 60 year old clergyman who had a fungus excrescence on his penis and whose, quote, general state of health has in some degree suffered partly from confinement and anxiety having a very numerous family dependent solely on his income. Now, moreover, as with the breast, the penis functioned as a synecdoche for general gender identity as a whole, thereby lending its disease and cure a particular imaginative potency. In 1819, for example, John Abernethy regaled his St. Bartholomew's Hospital students with the story of a nobleman whose stricture of the urethra 
um, he had treated by the insertion of a bougie. So he, he had a, a stricture which meant he found it very difficult to urinate and had basically a, a kind of thin tube inserted into his urethra um, to clear passage for, for his urine. And as Abernethy told his students, quote, to show the state of his mind on this subject, shortly after he called on me and said, last night I dined with my club in St. James's Street and whilst at cards had occasion to go to the chamber pot and my water quite rattled in it. So that a friend said to me, why, my lord, you piss like a stone horse, whilst when I first came to you, I only passed my urine by drops. Now, this intimate association between the genitals and masculine identity was perhaps unsurprisingly most clearly evident and certainly most fraught in cases of sexually transmitted disease. As both Jennifer Evans and Emily Cox have, have, Cox have shown, it was in such instances where men were most likely to express reticence, embarrassment, and perhaps even shame. Thus, shortly after the preceding case of the urinating nobleman, Abernethy recounted another instance of genital urinary affliction, this time with a decidedly more dubious origin. As he told his students, quote, a gentleman who came from America had the first woman he went with when he came to this country, as he said, give him a crop of sores, foul, irritable, and long and many, for which I gave him mild doses of mercury, and he got well. He swore, however, he would have no more to do with women whilst in this country, as they were all bad alike. But one night, uh, being at the theatre, a girl gave him a tweak of the penis through his breeches, and he got another crop of sores, of the same, of, sorry, of the same long enduring sores. Well, I said, as there can be no reason of supposing these venereal, you had better not use mercury, but only bathe it and use such means as you have used before. Now, unless we were inclined to believe that this man contracted venereal disease merely by having his penis tweaked through his britches while at the theatre, we might suppose that he sought to conceal the full truth of his sexual activities. After all, in the early 19th century, the theatre was a notorious haunt of sex workers, and between the 1750s and 1790s, there was even a published guide available to all the prostitutes working in London's theatre and entertainment district entitled Harris's List of Covent Garden Ladies. Perhaps this American gentleman was a little ashamed of having been afflicted with venereal sores for a second time, having apparently failed to learn his lesson, despite his vociferous protestations. Even so, he was not quite so ashamed as to conceal the origins of his initial infection. In this regard, what is perhaps more remarkable is that Abernethy was seemingly content to indulge this man's convenient fiction, suggesting that there was no reason to believe that his second crop of sores was venereal. As Evans and Koch have suggested of the earlier period, the degree of shame attached to venereal disease and the resultant moral censure to which they were occasionally subjected even by medical practitioners, could discourage men from consulting a socially respectable physician or surgeon, and instead seek out the services of quacks and other itinerant and unorthodox specialists. Now, this may still have been true in the early 19th century, but the fact that this man was at least partially open about the origins of his complaint, and the fact that he was treated without apparent judgment, suggests that shame had relatively little role to play in this particular clin clinical encounter. Indeed, in other instances, we find male patients referring to sexually transmitted disease with seemingly no compunction whatsoever. In August 1835, for example, Astley Cooper received a letter from his former pupil, Henry James Prince, surgeon to the General Infirmary at Bath, who would later become notorious as the founder of the Agapemonite religious sect. Prince wrote that during his medical studies in London, which were, uh, were attended with, quote, some degree of medical anxiety, my attention was attracted to a gradual decline of general health by the enlargement of two or three glands of the right groin. This condition, he maintained, was exacerbated by his contracting gonorrhea in September 1833. But he mentions this fact with no reticence, no elaboration, and certainly no apology. Now, given that Prince's later Agapemonite followers would mostly consist of unmarried women, and that he would become infamous for his sexually um, illicit behaviour, such brage and honesty is perhaps unsurprising. But I think it is also reflective of a more general pattern. Indeed, while Prince was, in many respects, an exceptional character, he was, in other respects, eminently typical of, this, of his period. Thus, it was anxiety rather than shame that defined his emotional response to his condition. As he wrote, quote, 
The impression upon my mind is that the presence of the disease testis is the only prevention to recovery, and that my health will never be restored without the extirpation of the gland. I am 24 years of age, of a nervous and irritable temperament, and extremely susceptible to external impressions of every kind. So to conclude, in many ways, Prince's claim to be extremely susceptible to external impressions of every kind could serve to describe early 19th century understandings of bodily health more generally. At this time, the uh, connection between emotional and physical states was perceived to be an intimate and codependent one. Just as emotions could induce physical disease, so might physical disease produce or exacerbate emotional states. And the emotion that, above all, defined the production and experience of disease in this period was anxiety. That early 19th century surgical patients should be worried about their health should hardly surprise us. Despite the best efforts of its practitioners, the curative efficacy of contemporary surgery remained extremely limited, meaning that patients and practitioners alike tended to regard operations as a shared tragedy and a mutual ordeal. As John Abernethy told his students in 1827, the necessary performance of an operation is or ought to be a humiliating reflection, since it contains a confession that our art is inadequate to the cure of disease. In this regard, it is revealing that both patients and practitioners spoke about the experience of surgery in very similar ways. In 1856, for example, the Scottish academic George Wilson reflected on the operation he had undergone to remove his foot in 1842, four years prior to the introduction of anaesthesia. At that period, he wrote, quote, a patient preparing for an amputation was like a condemned criminal preparing for execution. And when he informed of the need for amputation, he, quote, asked a week to prepare for it, not with the slightest expectation that the disease would take a favourable turn in the interval, or that the anticipated horrors of the operation would become less appalling by reflection upon them but simply because it was so probable that the operation would be followed by a fatal issue that I wished to prepare for death and what lies beyond it, whilst my faculties were clear and my emotions were comparatively undisturbed. Meanwhile, John Abernethy, on being asked how he felt before performing what was referred to as an important operation, used identical language, famously claiming, I feel as if I was going to be hanged. Now, the world of romantic surgery was then one drenched in pathos. It was a period when many people struggled with deeply disfiguring and agonizingly painful conditions with little or no prospect of relief and were faced with a choice of living with a life limiting and potentially fatal condition um, or risking an often unimaginably painful and likewise potentially fatal operation. In 1817, for example, Charles Jameson of Inverness wrote to his fellow Scot Alex Mackenzie in London, seeking help to alleviate a sore on his penis that prevented him from urinating without extreme pain and putting what he called his whole frame into a kind of stupefied state. He begged Mackenzie to solicit the advice of Ashley Cooper, quote, as may either relieve me or, or that I may conclude nothing can be done for me and that I must struggle with my distress and meet the consequences. Within this emotional regime then, um, there was, I would suggest, comparatively little room for shame. We are often inclined to think of history as a progressive process, to regard the past as more morally censorious and emotionally regressive than our own age. But I would argue that in many cases, romantic surgical patients were less inclined to feel shame about their ailments than people are today, not because they were more morally enlightened, but because the limitations of contemporary healthcare, as well as the general cultures of the era, encouraged, perhaps even required, a degree of emotional openness, especially from those caught between the ravages of disease and what one contemporary commentator called the hard doom of operative surgery. And that's the end. Thank you very much for listening. And um, I'm grateful for the Welcome Trust, I should say, for funding the research. And uh, please do, if you haven't read it, uh, check out my book on Cambridge Core, which is fully available, fully uh, open access. There we go. Brilliant. Thank you. Mike, and um, we've got just over half an hour for questions and discussion. So um, I look forward to um, the discussion. And I was just going to say, if you have a link to the book, you could pop it in the chat. That might. Mm. I will um, do. Absolutely.
Um, I'll just yeah, do that, that now. That was fascinating. And um, yeah, I mean, it's so interesting to speculate on the different ways that shame and stigma land around bodily conditions and cancer. And I guess it's speculation, isn't it? When you don't see something in the in the evidence, then <laughs> it's wondering, is it not there because the shame of it kept it from being there? Or is it not there because really actually there were different norms and standards about um yeah what what was embarrassing or shameful so it's fascinating to think about that um yeah I mean I should, I should say I should say in response to that, Linda, yeah I mean in a part of this paper is yeah I haven't found it <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's not my my sense is that you know not that it's in, it's unimaginable that it would be there of course but I think I think other historians of the early modern period and pre the pre-modern period I think have also found that there's perhaps comparatively less space for shame than you might imagine, you yeah. know, in, in, in dealing with physical conditions. And I think some of that has to do in part with, you know, the kind of expectations of bodily norms, which, you know, mm. you know, one thing, I mean, obviously I've shared some images there, which are not necessarily easy things to look at, but, you know, people in this period were walking around with conditions that we just can't even imagine in terms of their physical presentation. And that wasn't uncommon. And I guess, you know, when, when people don't have a model of bodily perfection, <laughs> well, they do, yeah. but, that people will actually, you know, um, uh, meet it. I think it's it maybe a different attitude towards those those kind of disfiguring elements. Anyway, absolutely, where the idealized body is is completely out of reach, maybe except for some very privileged aristocrats or something, <laughs> then it's different. Um, there is a question in the chat, and then if anyone has a question or a comment, um, you can raise your hand, and I can call on people as their hands are raised. But I'm not sure if you can see the chat, but it says, could you talk about the term hysteria? <laughs> Was this word used during the time period of your study? Was it thought to be an etiology of any solid tumor disease? Um, yes, yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, yes, it does. It does appear in my period, um, notably from around the 1830s and 40s, particularly by the 1840s. It really appears quite aggressively in the in the archive. Uh, in the earlier period, um, less so um that isn't to say that there isn't uh i mean one thing i wanted to do in this you know paper and in the book is kind of you know talk about the gendered aspects of of of, of cancer for example breast cancer and the ways in which it's linked to idealized femininities of uh, a kind of I idealized motherhood but of course there are other ways other more insidious ways and perhaps potentially more sinister ways in which kind of disease is linked to gender so um, you know, the stop um, cessation of menses and other kinds of factors, which later become associated with things like hysteria, are also associated with the production of cancer. Um, Cooper talks about there being a very close correspondence between the breast and the uterus. So there's a kind of inchoate, you know, there's a there's a long-standing kind of association between kind of gendered um, physiology and the production of disease. But where one sees hysteria really beginning to enter, I say, is in the 1840s, when I think hysteria kind of enters its second life as a as a as a kind of um widespread um factor in medical diagnosis of, of of the diseases of women in particular um and i found it used um to describe not only the kind of generation of disease um but also response to pain um so it's used sometimes by practitioners in one case that i cite in the book but to talk about men's excessive emotional response to pain being equivalent of the hysteric so there it, it comes in 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 i think very powerful in the from the 1840s onwards um and for example one one art one art piece i looked at in, in the archive um of the royal college surgeons which i haven't really been able to do anything with as yet but is is, is joseph um lister's student submission to a prize um competition um which is basically a collection of his kind of hospital case notes and the stuck I, I swear about a third of the hysteric patients you know so like by the 18 sort of 40s and 50s hysteria is is is, is really kind of emerged as a very significant force in 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 medical and surgical practice yeah thank you so there's another question in the chat thank you for the fascinating talk could you please share something about the attitude towards leprosy and disfigurement and the difference in the attitude of the doctors towards leprosy in 19th century compared to the medieval perceptions not sure uh, i'd love to be able to answer that with more authority and more um, knowledge than i have leprosy hasn't really um hasn't really been a feature of the archive that i've been looking at um so i can't answer that directly 
I mean, one thing I could, one way I guess I could come at something like that obliquely is is the sort of you know what 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 place did disfigurement have in kind of moral perceptions of the patient or or, or kind of, and I think I think you know, uh, yeah, again, I, I wouldn't want to be definitive about this, but I, I kind of set you know. I sense that there's a there's a less over moralizing about disfigurement per se, although in this period, you know, you still have very much a sense that the face is a marker of character and identity. Um, and kind of disfigurement of the face is 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 deeply problematic even in the 19th century as it is, you know, in the early period and later. So yeah, I'm sorry, I, I can't say I can't speak to leprosy because it just hasn't it hasn't featured in my in my research, I'm afraid. I'm very sorry. Uh -huh. okay. Next question from the chat. Thank you for the talk. It was quite informative. Can you please share your thoughts on where we are now and kind of compare romanticism from then and now? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you asked that. Um, it's almost like I planted you in the audience. I mean, I, 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 because one of the purposes of the book has been to kind of reflect on what a study of um, the the kind of early the early 19th century the kind of era of romantic surgery as i call it can can kind of how it can inform contemporary surgical debates in surgery and i think you know what i show in the book is that you know by the latter part of the 19th century emotions had increasingly been marginalized within surgical culture both in terms of surgical self expression and identity but also with particularly within kind of um, assessment of the patient and the patient's you know health you know, emotion just, you know, didn't play as an important role in, in kind of um, treating patients and in, and, in, and in kind of managing them as it had to in an era before an, an, anesthesia and as I showed in the book, antisepsis as well. Um, so I think throughout much of the 20th century, kind of emotions have played comparatively little role in surgical practice, identity and kind of um, epistemology. Um, and and in many ways have been seen, as I say, as, as a kind of contaminant to rational decision making. Right. You know, you want to keep emotions out of surgery. You want to you want to kind of, you know, make judgments based on kind of best practice, et cetera, et cetera, not be kind of too drawn in. There's the other argument, which is, you know, you can't be emotionally overwhelmed by the by the, um, you know, by the experiences of your patients. And you have to maintain a certain emotional distance for your own mental health, et cetera. Um, and I think. We're beginning to see the limits of that um, and, and consider the limits of that. And one of the thing I cite in the book um, is a surgeon who I won't name, who I do name in the book, but in an interview um, in, in a few years ago, he said he's a very well-known cardiothoracic surgeon. He said that um, you had to be a psychopath to be a good surgeon, basically. Um, and that essentially you had to be emotion, emotions free. And I think we're coming to question that now. And I think we're coming to appreciate the kind of place of emotional intelligence and emotional emotional intelligent Ooh. communication in healthcare um and and i think so i think this is speaking to you know changing contemporary surgical norms and i also think another thing that's really fascinating is is you know we have a we, we have different um conditions within the operating theater now so in an era you know after the 1840s when patients were effectively you know uh, rendered you know silent by an by an general anesthesia um you know one didn't have to consider the emotions of the patient or any kind of agency whereas now we've got things like nerve blocks and sedatives and things where you know the patient is actually conscious uh during during procedures and so i think it, there's an increasing um utility in thinking about actually how you how you manage and communicate with a sentient patient in in an operation and i think that's something which surgeons are now you know now increasingly Ooh. aware of Great, thank you. Um, next question from Sarah in the chat. You mentioned anxiety as a primary emotional condition. I suppose that medical practitioners use both as a cause and symptom of illness. Would you be able to expand on other emotional conditions that doctors used in similar ways? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the kind of interesting things about this book, one of the challenges of writing it, as you can probably imagine from the material, some of the images and some of the cases I'm recounting, is that positive emotions are relatively few and far between, you know? If patients have got to the stage where they're consulting a surgeon to have something cut out of them or cut off, um, you know, joy and 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 happiness aren't as as present as 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 maybe perhaps you know more negative emotions. Although there is a little bit of that 
deliverance and and kind of happiness and joy um, of being delivered of disease. But I guess most of the emotions that I associate as part of both productive of and resulting from surgical conditions are negative. So anxiety will be one and it's kind of cognate, but things like dread, there's a lot of discussion of dread, despondency. So one of the imperatives of, of pre-anesthetic surgery was to manage your patient's mood kind of going into and coming out of the operation. So the operation was a point of crisis um, and intra intraoperative death was not unknown. Um, but a lot of patients, you know, either died, died immediately afterwards or shortly afterwards. And one, things, one of the things, you know, surgeons were encouraged to do was kind of monitor their patient's mood um, and actually make judgments based upon their emotional um, presentation, effectively, you know, as to what could or should be done. So if they, for example, were incredibly despondent, if they believed that the operation was going to end fatally, then they'd say, don't operate. You know, just it's 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 if you operate in that condition, the patient's going to die. Right? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If the patient thinks they're going to die, they will die. Um, and equally afterwards, if they you need to watch them for despondency um so that you know they don't sink basically you know in and and die and and, and in in an era before any meaningful conception of post-operative infection um one of the ways you account for um people dying off operation is is emotional states is their state of mind um that they were so overwhelmed by the operation they you know they, they entertain it as kind of you know they, they, they have this spectrum of dread um so yeah i mean anxiety and so dread and, and despondency, I guess, are two of those kind of um, emotions. I guess anger as well is another emotion that can be both that is often productive of 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 disease. So anything that can agitate the constitution um, uh, is thought as being as putting people at, at risk. Um, so while for women it might be you know things like the anxiety deriving from motherhood or or, or, or anxiety deriving from marriage, it's another thing I, I didn't mention. A lot of these women, um, you know, their cancer is attributed to emotionally abusive husbands, um, and the kind of anxiety produced by those conditions. But also, you know, men can you know through their moods can can produce. Um, can produce states of of, of pathology, um, so you know anger or or a kind of you know extreme male temperaments are often seen as kind of being putting people at risk. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, so all the all the questions are coming in the chat. So David, thank you very much to the person who asked about hysteria and Michael's answer. As a follow up, could Michael please elaborate on what he thinks gave rise to the nineteenth century phenomena of hysteria and why it later appears to have gone away? Thanks very much, David. Um, it's an interesting question. I think, you know, there's been a lot of literature, both on his, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on hysteria, I should say, um, uh, on the, there's, there's, there's many people who know more about the history of hysteria than I do. But where I've encountered it, certainly in surgical discourse, um, you know, it comes into, into four in the 18, I say 1840s, in the kind of, you know, post romantic, early Victorian era, when it's been suggested you start to kind of see a, a, a kind of further hardening of gender boundaries, right? So, you know, this old idea of golden age to separate spheres, right? That there was a kind of period when when kind of women had a more fluid um, uh, kind of um, more 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 kind of freedom to operate within within certain within public space, and that by the eighteen mid nineteenth century, this is kind of increasingly being um, uh, shut down, and women are being regarded as fundamentally kind of pathological or pathologized increasingly pathologized there's increasing interest in the um diseases of women as a condition one of the people i mentioned in this regard uh, thomas laycock who's someone i've studied in a different capacity in my first book who's a who writes a book in the 1840s on the on the diseases of women um he's a you know early proponent of hysteria um and the kind of sense in which women are perceived as being physiologically weak i mean there, there's there's an argument from being perceived as physiologically weak in an earlier period because of their the, the, the delicacy of their nerves, but it becomes kind of rooted in in their biology uh, in this period, um, and women are fundamentally seen as physiologically and emotionally unstable entities who need to be very carefully managed, um, not only you know in in matters of health but just in in their lives 
Um, and, and, you know, that, that kind of comes to the fore as all that literature suggests in, in the kind of 18, late 19th century, and particularly places like France and Central Europe, where, um, you know, hysteria comes to the fore as a neurological, as a fundamentally kind of neurological condition um uh that afflicts you know that that afflicts women and um yeah it, there, there's a there's a you could talk for hours about hysteria and there's 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 there's, there's, there's people who, who know a lot more about it but i think um i think it, it, you know it comes from a kind of particular cultural moment uh, uh when women are seen as increasingly kind of um you know vulnerable to disease and pathologized in them in and of themselves thank you and the next question is also Touching on hysteria, excellent. This is Chris. Excellent presentation. Given the high volume of patients described as hysterical, is there any indication in the archive of women rejecting or denying that as a factor in or cause of their conditions? Are their opinions recorded? Um, first thing to say about that is in the majority of the work I've done on the kind of patient agency um, has been for the eighteen, the period before the eighteen forties. So um, I have less material on the kind of patients from the, of the patient's voice from after that period. And then in a sense, the focus of my book shifts slightly anyways after, after that period. Um, so I'm not, I wouldn't be in a position to answer that um, with particular, uh, uh, in any particular depth. Um, in more general terms, there's certainly a sense in which women can shape their diagnosis and treatment and again that varies by their social class and by their relationship with their doctor so most of the women who are writing to cooper or are having letters written on their behalf to cooper are fee paying patients and therefore he is basically being paid by them and they have a quite a profound degree of agency in determining um not only you know how their disease is understood um but also how it's treated that's less um common with hospital patients who are kind of there you know because because they're desperate and because you know they are receiving treatment for free uh, as an act of gratuitous you know as an act of benevolence and therefore but you do see women i mean you know you see women let's take the case of breast cancer women who you know come into the hospital they say i want to be treated like this and they're not and they walk out they leave um, or they make more they have kind of demands to be treated in particular ways. And there are ways, as I suggest in the book, of exercising agency even within that kind of context. Um, but no, I'm a roundabout way of saying I'm afraid I don't have a lot of examples, certainly not from the early period, because it's not so prevalent of women, as it were, rejecting that label or, or, or contradicting it. But I do have examples of women exerting kind of, you know, quite significant agency in their treatment for the early period. Great, thank you. Um, another question from David, which is something I've actually wondered myself. May I please ask another question? In the era before the understanding of bacteria and the necessity of sterilizing medical instruments, how did anyone survive surgery instead of dying for infections caused by surgery? <laughs> I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a good question. Um, more by luck than than judgment in many cases. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the mind boggles often at the kinds of conditions that people endured, but also the kinds of operations they had to undergo or did undergo. We tend to think of kind of pre-anesthetic surgery as being, and it is compared to modern surgery, relatively non-invasive, apart from things like, um, uh, you know, cutting for the stone and so on, which are invasive into the bladder. Um, but I mean, you saw from one of the images I showed earlier of the, re the resection of the mandible bone. I mean, people are having their jaws effectively removed, you know, without anesthesia. And how people survive that, I mean, how people survive the shock of it is remarkable. And, and many people don't survive the shock, actually. You know, people do do um, die from shock, both um, during the operation or immediately afterwards. Um, and how they don't deserve to die from infection is also uh, remarkable. Um, some bodies were more resilient than others. And, and I think some people were lucky and some people unlucky. I mean, you know, it's important to point out that operative mortality is murderously high compared to modern you know compared to modern um statistics and actually even in the 1860s so even after the introduction of of um anesthesia when you don't when shock isn't so much of a concern patients are still dying in quite frequently from infections and that's really when you get this kind of when germ theory and antisepsis come to the fore because you know they 
listen, uh, listen and, and uh, in others provide an explanation for why patients are dying. But there's all sorts of debate as to why they die in such large numbers after disease. So the question is, you know, how did people survive um, um, through luck and and uh, through skill too? I mean, I don't want to deprecate the skill of contemporary surgeons. It's quite remarkable what they did. But in many cases, it was, yeah, it was seen as, you know, if you look at George Wilson's testimony, I mean, he assumes he's going to die, basically, um, from having his foot removed, which is not the most invasive and certainly not the most technically complex operation of the period. In even he expects to die from that. So yeah, um, with 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 um, you know, remarkable luck, I think is the answer to that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, next question, Charles Lee. This has been a riveting talk and question and response. Many thanks. 20th century medicine has a history that includes the exploitation of and experimentation on vulnerable people, for example, racial minorities, incarcerated convicts, drafted soldiers, concentration camp prisoners. Is there any evidence of surgeons experimenting on vulnerable populations in the 19th century? Uh, in short answer, absolutely, yes. Yes, of course. I mean, the most famous example of this is probably Marion Sims, um, you know, in, in the US, a gynecologist and obstetrician who, who, who experimented on um, enslaved women. Um, and, and, you know, that, yeah, there you have a kind of situation in which those kind of inequalities of power are particularly, um, particularly marked. Um, but even in in situations as in as in Britain after you know um, after the early nineteenth century where you don't after the abolition of slavery where you don't have such a stark disparity um, parishes you still there are absolutely inequalities of power which surgeons exploit for their own personal and professional ends um, so there's no doubt that surgeons conduct procedures on patients in hospitals because they want to conduct I mean. They think it will help, but you know, there's clear evidence that levels of consent are more complicated. I mean, I've in the book alone, I've got examples of you know clearly issues where you know in a modern sense, consent is abs completely absent. You know, someone who arrives at a hospital, um, a, a woman who who arrives um, unconscious and and drunk, and she has a leg amputated while she's unconscious. You know, and and now they they may explanation may be well, you know, it had to be done. You know, it saved her life, but there was no consent sought or given there. Um, most pertinently, and think in terms of the work I look at and things I look at in the book is the appropriation of bodies for anatomical dissection, which famously in 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 the nineteenth century is uh, you know sourcing cadavers from the graves of the poor um by by illicitly having them stolen um and then later on in the 1820s and early 1830s campaigning um for a change in the law so that they see your that surgeons are given the bodies of of um un, people who die un, whose bodies are unclaimed in workhouses um uh and, and hospitals and prisons and so we in a sense have a very strong association in, by the 1830s between surgical knowledge and the operations of the state you know so like giving the bodies of the poor to doctors to surgeons to dissect is seen by contemporary utilitarian inspired politicians to be in the national interest in the public good uh, and what I mentioned in the book is about the ways in which that process of appropriation is configured in emotional terms. So, you know, you get you get spokespeople for the Anatomy Act, what becomes the Anatomy Act, saying, well, a body has no emotional significance unless there's someone there to mourn it, you know. So if you have no friends, your body means nothing, you know. It's just an object. It can be it can be appropriated because it has no emotional significance. Um, emotions are only kind of, you know, um, um, interpersonal. You know, there is no inherent emotional value in a body. So there is a gap ways in which I think the exploitation of the poor is configured in, in ways that, you know, mollify middle class sensibilities. You know? um, so, yeah, absolutely is the answer, the, the short answer. That was the longer answer. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, there's one more question that's just come to me in a direct message, but I think it's intended for everyone. Um, so this has been an excellent discussion, and I look forward to reading Michael's book. I was wondering if you researched the shame of World War I soldiers who returned disfigured and their struggle with this, and possibly the work of Anna Coleman-Ladd in helping with this transition back into society with her facial masks. 
Um, I don't go up to the First World War. Um, I don't include the First World War. I only got to 1912, so I haven't I haven't um, uh, looked at this uh, myself. But there is a lot of very excellent work on facial disfigurement in the First World War. Um, and uh, actually, uh, in the audience, I don't want to call her out, but we have a Christine Slobogan who's written uh, excellently on, on, on facial disfigurement in the Second World War uh, and some of the kind of parallels there. So, so yeah, I, I haven't personally um, researched that material, but there is, um, you know, there is a wealth of, 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 of really excellent literature out there on that topic. Great. Um, so I have a kind of question. I've been doing some, this is completely left field based on all the questions that you've had <laughs> so far, but I've been doing some research into telemedicine, which is like the remote mm -hmm. delivery of healthcare, which is something the surgeons engage in quite a lot with through telesurgery and things and how, um, the, and its relationship to shame and embarrassment, because as everyone probably knows, like shame and embarrassment can be a barrier to treatment insofar as people may avoid clinical encounters or not disclose yeah. properly and so on because they're ashamed or embarrassed or they're fearing negative judgment from a person with more social power and authority and so on. And then there's some sort of evidence emerging that if people are interacting with like an AI bot or they're interacting with their healthcare provider, like in a mediated way, that actually lessens the self-consciousness and the fear of negative judgment and when you were talking about how people were like very honestly disclosing in their letters to the surgeon that was coming to mind because I was like well it's it's kind of easier to because the, the letter is like a kind of basic telemedical technology right <laughs> so you're, yes. you're, getting, you're dispensing healthcare in a mediated way through a letter or maybe receiving the disclosure of symptoms and so on and so I wonder if if there's some something there about how the the, the possibility of negative judgment or fear of negative judgment. And then it made me think about like power relations because we have a whole kind of discourse in, with contemporary medicine about like the discrepancy in power between patient and the physician and, and, and were there similar power relation discrepancies because you're talking about a lot of kind of upper class patients who may not have felt, you know, so yeah, those are just kind of a couple of things to reflect on power and telemedicine mediating emotions or or transforming emotional experiences uh, uh, yeah i mean the, in response to your first question ab absolutely yeah i mean I, I think you see it very clearly in that that example i gave of norris and scatchard you know the, the chap who said you know i've got the who had this you know um condition with his penis and he said well you know i may be abashed in your presence um uh and i said he didn't catch his shame per se he's like you know i i'm i'm an ignorant country you know gentleman i don't know anything about medicine um but he said, you know, in this letter, I'll, I'll, you know, it's better to do me to do this sort of as it were at my fireside and, and and so on. So there's definitely a sense in which I think the letter mediates those those forms of 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 interpersonal communication. And of course, you know, you know, medicine it's entirely it's not possible to do surgery by letter entirely, but it's certainly possible to do a lot of medicine by letter in this period. And 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 actually, a lot of surgical aftercare is done through um letters and through intermediaries of course the problem is you know how do we then reconstruct the actual physical you know the actual physical in the impersonal encounters and they're very difficult we all we have left all the traces we have left are the textual ones in the, in the kind of letters um and there's certainly a sense in which these letters are part of a dialogue that also involves physical you know in-person consultations um and so people will write to cooper after they've seen him or before they see him uh, uh and, and and as part of a kind of continuing a relationship um so i think yes it's absolutely true i I, th I think i think it does serve a mediating function and you can kind of see in the description i read from cooper's book which of course is admittedly um generic in the sense that it's it's a kind of genre writing and it's and it's uh, you know it's kind of romanticized but the idea of this you know this this woman who thinks that she's got breast cancer and then is you know told that she doesn't and she's 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 gratified but that kind of sense of of reticence, I think, in 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 that consultation that 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 um, is does come across in that. In terms of power dynamics, yeah, I mean it's 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 complicated by definitely by institutional kind of the spatial and institutional frameworks within which those consultations take place. So certainly for Cooper's private patients, many of whom are, you know, his social equals. I mean, Cooper's quite well to do as it happens socially for a for a for a, for a for a surgeon anyways and he's a he's um he's he's a baron by the latter part of his career 
um, he's knighted by I think George IV. Um, but he, he, so he's quite socially elevated, but he is also dealing with many people who are also quite well to do, you know. So, so there's probably less of a sense of 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 um, uh, disparity of social position. But it's certainly in the case of his um, hospital patients, there's there's a clearer disparity of power. But that isn't to say that you know he he conceives of their conditions differently. You know, I mean, you still see that references a lot of the references to kind of motherhood and anxiety come from his hospital records as well as his as well as the letters um but again it's harder to establish the the nature of those relationships because all we have of the hospital records are his case notes which can be quite terse um quite brief uh, whereas with the letters we don't have his correspondence we have their correspondence which suggests a kind of you know a dialogue um so i think yeah it really does vary hugely um, depending on depending on social status. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, one I, one more uh, question in the chat from David again. Would women diagnosed with hysteria in the nineteenth century be diagnosed as such today, or has the definition of hysteria changed since the last half of the nineteenth century? No, women wouldn't be diagnosed with hysteria today. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> it's not a it's not an identifiable condition that would be used today. So no, no. I mean, there's all sorts of questions about the gendering of mental health you know, um, uh, uh, diagnosis and treatment and so on, uh, which, you know, which, 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 you know, are still, um, you know, probably deeply problematic, but, 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 um, but no hysteria is not one of those conditions. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Well, that was the last question in the chat. Does anyone have a final question or comment before we wrap up? Um, we're almost at 25 past three. Um, and yeah, if not, I think we can probably finish here. And I just really like to thank you, Michael, for your talk. It was fascinating and yeah, really, really, I was just gonna say really vivid illustrations. <laughs> but, really uh, like, yeah, sometimes really I actually had to like look away. Yeah, yeah, I'm <laughs> yeah. sorry about that. You know, no, uh, no, it's, I mean, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, it is, it's just fascinating when you try and piece, piece together what actually went on and yeah. Thank you for sharing um, your research and the link to your book. Um, and I look forward to seeing everyone again at our next um, seminar. Um, just before we finish to thank Michael, I'm just gonna put the link to the, the seminar series in the chat. Um, we have another seminar coming on the 5th of October with Professor Laura, Ke uh, Laura Kelly, looking at um, narratives of reproductive and sexual health in 2020. 20th century Ireland so everyone is very welcome to that and yep just to finish thank you again Michael it's been a pleasure having you and uh, yep I uh, hope to see you soon thank, thank you. you so much speak to you soon bye bye bye